This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Esther Gidui Yuat. It's Friday, April 2nd. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. A boat carrying more than 1,000 survivors of a highly organized deadly attack by Islamic State linked insurgents in northern Mozambique arrived in the port of Pemba. Survivors who walked out crying were immediately escorted to safety by aid workers. Lucy Filder of Reuters has this report. A boat carrying more than a thousand survivors of a deadly attack by Islamic State-linked insurgents in northern Mozambique arrived in the port of Pemba on Thursday. Many of them distraught, as were the crowds of relatives waiting for their loved ones. Aid workers waited to give survivors food, and police and soldiers kept order. The government says dozens were killed in the highly organized attack on the gas town of Parma, which began last Wednesday. But the exact number of casualties isn't known. Mariamo Tagir was among many who fled and walked for days through the forest. <laughs> I'm so tired. It was seven days in the bush. I'm so tired. We came across evildoers several times. The situation is really bad. There are many dead. Many dead. <laughs> Tagir left her son behind in Parma. <laughs> it's very painful. I've been crying every day. I don't know where my son is. It's very painful. <laughs> Survivors have spoken of bodies in the streets, some decapitated. Reuters has been unable to independently verify accounts from Parma and most communication was cut off after the attack began. But Tagir describes similar horrors. They said they didn't want us. They wanted the military. <laughs> the military who were not in their uniforms were saved. Some of them were cutting the throats of people from there. Aid groups believe the attack displaced tens of thousands of people, many of whom fled into dense forest or attempted to escape by sea. Hundreds, including many foreign workers, have been evacuated by air. The fighting continued as recently as Tuesday, security sources said. Islamist insurgents have been increasingly active in the surrounding province of Cabo Delgado since 2017, although it is unclear what specifically they are fighting for. The district around Parma is home to natural gas projects worth $60 billion. A diplomatic source said there were roughly 1,200 displaced people on board the boat, including 300 children and 400 women. An official at the International Committee of the Red Cross said the government was screening those arriving at Pemba to prevent infiltration by armed groups. That report by Lucy Filder of Reuters. France faced mounting calls from rights groups on Thursday to open an investigation into an airstrike by its forces in Mali that a United Nations probe said killed 19 civilians at a wedding party. UN investigators published a report on Tuesday about the January 3rd strike, concluding that it killed 19 civilians and three armed men near the central Mali village of Bounty. France, which has more than 5,000 troops in Mali and neighboring West African countries, to battle militants linked to al-Qaeda and Islamic State, rejected the conclusions, saying it hit Islamist militants only. Domestic and international advocacy groups, including the Malian Association for Human Rights, Amnesty International and Oxfam France, demanded that France and Mali conduct their own independent investigations. French Defense Minister Florence Parley, who arrived in Mali late on Wednesday to visit French and other European troops, did not commit to an investigation when asked by reporters. The coronavirus pandemic has increased hunger and food insecurity in Zimbabwe, which was already struggling with a poor economy before the pandemic began, according to a government report released last week. The World Food Programme says 
the problem is especially acute for unemployed urban dwellers, Columbus Mavonga reports from Harare. The government report called Zimbabwe Vulnerability Assessment says about 2.4 million locals in the country's urban areas are struggling to meet their basic food needs because of lockdowns to contain the spread of COVID-19. Murambiwa Simon Mushongorokwa used to get casual factory jobs before the pandemic hit Zimbabwe. Maybe what, thirty dollars. I used to get about thirty dollars a week. It was not enough for my needs, but when the lockdown came, it got worse until I started growing mushrooms. He uses forage from his backyard, corn and sorghum field to grow the mushrooms. He says he now gets about $5 a week from selling it and uses some for consumption with his wife and five dependents. Simon Julius Kufakwevanu, an official from a local NGO, has been teaching people in this poor suburb to grow mushrooms. Before the innovation of uh, mushroom growing farming in this area, it was very tough for people in this community to survive because of the lockdown and so forth. But now, when fish of all brought in the mushroom growing, it's changing because you can now buy something. You are now able to, to go to the shops and buy mini meal, buy sugar and so forth. The World Food Program says it is looking for more ideas and resources to help 550,000 people like Mushongorokwa in urban areas get basic food for survival. COVID-19 has not only wide lives, it is wide livelihoods as well. The number of people who are unable to put food on their table in Zimbabwe's urban areas has increased from 30% during the same period in 2019 to 42% right now. Zimbabwe government says it is giving about $12 a month to families affected by lockdowns. That's nowhere near the $500 an average family of five to seven people needs to survive each month. People like Mushongorokwa hope that with the lockdowns recently eased, jobs and livelihoods will come back. In the meantime, the WFP is seeking $32 million to feed food insecure urbanites. Columbus Mavungam for VOA News, Harare. A Nigerian startup has created a Wi-Fi-enabled cooling box that can keep blood, medicine, and vaccines at the correct temperature while being transported in the tropical heat. Angela Ukumadu reports. Distributing vaccines across Nigeria's hot and dry terrain is no easy feat. The country's limited facilities mean that medical samples need to be collected and transported often through poorly maintained roads to laboratories sometimes miles away. So last year, the government hired logistics startup Grid to help transport temperature-sensitive items. The company now uses cold chain monitoring boxes to move blood and plasma samples and vaccine vials. The cold boxes run on solar-powered batteries that can keep the units working for up to 24 hours. And they are the brainchild of Nigerian engineer-turned-entrepreneur Organetega Ayotin. Um, if you look at the African terrain, you know that some of the major challenges are one, communication, but secondly, which is more importantly, the lack of access to grid, which is access to power. Um, and so for that, when you look back, you would see that there were challenges around accessing um, ice packs or ice gels that are required to precondition when transporting things like vaccines or samples from the last mile to the city. Um, with this now, which you, you know, this is like a solar powered, battery powered device that doesn't require all the, so without the infrastructure, this works. The company launched its Wi-Fi linked cooler boxes in 2019 meaning customers can track products and their temperatures in real time using a mobile application. The company charges at least $2.5 for delivery services, depending on the weight and distance packages are going. They plan to expand to other African countries, supporting health sectors and beyond. That was Angela Okumadu of Reuters reporting. India's temporary hold on major exports of AstraZeneca's COVID-19 shot 
will undermine Africa's vaccination plans and could have a catastrophic impact if extended, according to the head of the continent's disease control body, India decided to delay big exports of the shots made in its territory by the Serum Institute of India to make sure it could meet local demand, two sources told Reuters last week. The director of the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, John Kengasong, told a news conference in Addis Ababa that the hold, quote, will definitely impact our ability to continuously vaccinate people. He said the African Union had planned to vaccinate 30 to 35 percent of the continent's population by the end of the year, adding that delays could cause the target to be missed. Hundreds of thousands of seafarers are stranded across the world because of the coronavirus pandemic. Advocates for the seafarers say it is a humanitarian crisis that threatens supply chains. Henry Rigel reports from London. Ritesh Mera signed up for a four-month contract as captain of a liquid gas tanker in July last year. More than eight months later, he and his crew are still stuck on the ship, unable to leave because of the coronavirus pandemic. So the thought of not being able to go back home in time and the thought of being chained to this particular place and in a way you can also say jailed is getting on to crew now. They are thinking more about it than the actual job at hand. There are an estimated 1.6 million seafarers worldwide. In normal times, they work four to six month contracts before crews are rotated. But global travel restrictions made those rotations increasingly difficult, according to Guy Platten of the International Chamber of Shipping. By the autumn, we had well over 400,000 who are far beyond their original contract tour lengths. And some of them have been on board for well over a year, up to 18 months. Platten estimates that some 100,000 seafarers are still stranded. But what we're really feared of now is that just as we are starting to make progress with the new variants, it's starting to get worse again. And of course, with the uh, idea of some sort of vaccine passport being introduced by countries as they come out of COVID, it's just going to go back to square one again. In the waters off Hong Kong, dozens of ships lie at anchor, their crews unable to come ashore because of the pandemic. Reverend Stephen Miller of the local Seafarers Mission runs a supply launch that delivers goods such as mobile phone SIM cards and snacks to the crew members on board. He fears for their mental health. You can just imagine it for yourself. You've been planning to go home, you've been planning to do things for your family or maybe see a young child for the first time uh, in many, many months and that then is taken away from you. So uh, that obviously leads to sadness, which can lead to depression. Several shipping firms, trade bodies and maritime labour organisations have signed the Neptune Declaration on seafarer well-being and crew change. It calls for all nations to recognise seafarers as key workers, allow them to travel and offer them priority vaccines. Chief Officer Karen Marshall spoke to VOA on her way back home to Texas after being stuck at sea for several months. Merchant mariners should definitely be priorities when it comes to getting a vaccine and the fact that we're not is insane to me. I think companies should work on making their employees um, getting the vaccine for their employees so that we can start getting back to a normal crew change, normal rotations, we can all go back to our families. The signatories to the Neptune Declaration say seafarers will play a vital role in maintaining supply chains required to roll out global vaccination programs and all countries must recognize them as key workers. Henry Ridgewell for VOA News, London. Tell us what you think about Africa 54. Join the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com still to come. Tanzania's Msafiri Zawose talks about his music amid COVID-19. We'll be right back.
Welcome back to Africa 54. Prosecutors make their case on day four in the trial of Derek Chauvin, the former police officer charged in the death of George Floyd. Viewers Jesusa Meani has more. Seth Bravender, one of two paramedics who responded to the scene outside Cup Foods on May 25, 2020, described seeing officers on top of the patient when they arrived. Um, and there was a gesture made with your hand. What were you attempting to do at that point in time? Uh, just have the officer move. That patient, he testified, was 46-year-old George Floyd, who was still pinned under former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin's knee. From what I could see where I was at, I didn't, I didn't see any breathing. Chauvin's former supervisor criticized the prolonged use of force. Do you have an opinion as to when the restraint of Mr. Floyd should have ended in this encounter? Yes. What is it? When Mr. Floyd was no longer offering up any resistance to the officers, they could have ended their restraint. On day four of the murder trial of the now-fired police officer, the second paramedic who provided medical assistance to Floyd took the stand. Derek Smith told jurors Floyd's pupils were dilated and that he was unable to detect a pulse. In lay terms, I thought he was dead. Both paramedics outlined to jurors their unsuccessful life-saving efforts. I showed up, he was deceased, and I dropped him off at the hospital, and he was still in cardiac arrest. Earlier in the day, jurors heard from Floyd's girlfriend of three years, a mama's boy she called him and told the jury about the first time they met. I was so tired. We had been through so much, my sons and I. The kind person just to come up to me and say, can I pray with you when I felt alone in this lobby? It was so sweet. <laughs> Ross also recounted how they both struggled with opioid addiction. Chauvin's defense lawyer questioned Ross about Floyd's pattern of use, including about an incident when Floyd was hospitalized because of an overdose. You, you did not know that he had taken heroin at that time? No. Defense attorneys argue that Floyd died of unrelated medical issues and drug use. Jason Samelny, VOA News. SpaceX had another rough day but still names the members of its all-civilian crew. Plus, a new study examines the effects of long-term space travel on the human body. VOA's Arasha Rabasadi has the week in space. Two, one. <laughs> Private spaceflight company SpaceX successfully test-launched its crewless Starship 11 this week from a foggy Boca Chica, Texas. The test came to an abrupt end minutes later when the rocket appeared to explode on its way back down to Earth. SpaceX engineer John Innsbrucker was providing commentary at the time. When we got to 10 kilometers, the entry, we had some nice views from the exterior camera showing uh, the flaps were quiet as we descended. But then we had the camera freeze up as we got into the engine ignition sequence, and so we're going to have to find out from the team what happened. Innsbrucker spoke over the final frozen image received from Starship 11, and he made it clear that the video feed would not return. Pieces of debris crashed as far as eight kilometers from the landing site. Meanwhile, a U.S. Congressional Committee this week announced an investigation into safety requirements regulators say the company violated on a commercial launch in December. But there is good news from SpaceX. The company announced the final members of the crew it plans to send on what it calls the world's first all-civilian mission to space. The Inspiration4 mission now includes an engineer and a teacher and is slated to launch no earlier than mid-September from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. SpaceX held a fundraising raffle to select the crew. And there are the two one-year crew members, Scott Kelly and Mikhail Kornienko. In other news, the journal Circulation published a report that says in space, your heart gets smaller. Astronaut Scott Kelly spent nearly a year on board the International Space Station from 2015 to 2016. In that time, his heart shrank by more than a quarter without the constant pull of gravity to make it work harder. The study compared Kelly's heart to that of famous distance swimmer Ben Lacombe and the parallels between weightlessness in space and swimming. Finally this week, a comet-like light show across the Pacific Northwest of the United States. 
It's actually debris from a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket that this week delivered a batch of the company's Starlink satellites before burning up upon re-entering Earth's atmosphere. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. A Kenyan music producer is taking his work to remote villages to record up and upcoming artists on location to offer something new and different for Kenya's competitive music industry. Juma Majanga caught up with producer Presta George in Awendo, Kenya, and filed this report. Alex, can we record? Kenyan music producer Presta George imagined how difficult it must be for village artists to get their songs on the radio, let alone become famous. And that's where George found his calling. I thought it was to bring these studios to the local people so that at least they can, can compete or they can sell their products. George takes everything he needs to record complete albums on location in remote areas in just a few days. From soloists to church choirs, this traveling producer's goal is to find music that otherwise wouldn't get distributed. This opportunity where we can get a studio where we are, it will, it will make us to air out the good talents, talents that we have, which could not be hard at all at all. Making his class dream a reality can come at a cost for George, as many village artists cannot afford to pay for production. But George says it is worth the risk to discover up-and-coming talent that would otherwise get missed by Nairobi's big production houses. If you want to be successful in the music business, you have to move to Nairobi, unfortunately. So the idea of moving studio, you know, that's a very brilliant idea. You take the studio to the people so that they can get that quality. We should do more of that so that we can empower the, art, uh, the, the local artists so that they can get access to the, uh, you know, quality audios. Kenya's music industry insiders say success comes down to technology and the popularity of artists. George says he is confident his traveling studio can get ahead of competition. Juma Majanga for VOA News, Awendo, Kenya. In our entertainment segment, traditional Gogo musician Safiri Zawose, son of the late world music icon Dr. Hukwe Zawose, has kept busy creating and performing in recent years. He has continued even under the shadow of COVID-19's devastating effects on working musicians worldwide. Heather Maxwell joined him recently from his home studio in Bagamoyo, Tanzania, to share the details beginning with his new music video, Sababa. Saviri, it is so nice to see you after many years. Yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> I wanted to congratulate you on your most recent music video, Sababa. Just love it. How would you describe this style of music? We call it uh, Zaga music, like it's like a traditional trap. Well, we call it Zaga here. What about the story of the song? There's a man and a woman. What's going on there? The whole entire song is supposed about telling about love, uh, okay. peace. It's all about that, it's like enjoying okay. the life. So it's yeah. Sababa, Rigamure, it's good and good. Uh -huh. So that's why we're showing the woman. Sababa, it's in Hebrew. Hebrew? It's Hebrew, yeah, from Israel. Oh, wow. Why did you choose that? I got inspiration from um, my students from Israel. It was a very fun way for me to hear Sababa because it sounded a little familiar. It sounded like a little, some African um, language, <laughs> some African, you know. It was right. like, Sababa, how come like you have a uh, Magni, Patish, uh, Ava. And then out uh, comes Sababa. And Sababa, it's um, cool, good. 
And then one of my friends was trying to join me, asking me, I said, ah, can they join you? And they say, maybe, but this is something different. Is this Saranya? Yeah, Saranya, they know Saranya. The rapper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Since you and I met in 2015, it was, yeah. you told me that, you know, your goal is to share traditional music with the world. I've been able to record and release. So I did um, very good collaborations with some UK musician, mm -hmm. uh, which came out in 2017. That was uh, um, Uhamiyaji? Uhamiyaji, yeah, Uhamiyaji. I like that. that. I like that. So, and that's like, it's opened me in the new door and the new way. So it seems like Uhamiyaji is it the, was the big, key. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, congratulations on that. That's and, um, great, man. It's so, it's so Sababa. It's so Sababa, yeah, exactly. It's Sababa, <laughs> <laughs> Did you perform at the Sauti Zabusara Festival? Yes, I did it. How was that? It was uh, unbelievable. People, they forgot you know, about the pandemic and they had no mask, they had nothing. Uh, as you know, Tanzania, we understand the situation and that's uh, the government has you know it has nothing to stop anyone it's always like reminding people to wear the mask and yeah. take care so that was only the thing that the loop that you can hear every time like take mm -hmm. care take care but it was not too much limitations and the festival went well thank you so much Safiri, for joining me from uh, bangamoyo it's great to see you and love your new song Sababa and can't wait to hear more yeah thank you so much too and um there's more coming up hopefully you enjoy it well <laughs> you, you so take much. care and stay Sababa all right you too stay Sababa all right <laughs> and that's our show for today be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at boafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, we wish you a great weekend.